picking up, I believe, where we left off on Friday, page 363. <clears throat> We're driving through Georgia. We see the little black kid, you know, it's mentioned that he's naked and such, and the grandmother says it's, you know, wonderful, if she could paint, she'd paint a picture of that and such. <clears throat> They keep going along the road, 363, paragraph just right about at the middle of the page. They pass a cotton field with five or six graves fenced in the middle of it. And the grandmother says, look at that graveyard. It's the old family burying ground. That belonged to the plantation. John Wesley, where's the plantation? And the grandmother jokes, you know, gone with the wind, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. How many graves are we told? Five or six. Why? What is O'Connor doing? Louder. I see you. <laughs> Han, is that your first name? Foreshadowing, okay? Family grave, family burial ground. She's preparing us, okay? <clears throat> so, hold on just one second. Oh, wake up here. She's preparing us. And the kids exchange, you know, comics and such. Bottom of 363, they keep going on. And... She tells them a story, and they make their way to the tower to stop for lunch. Okay, top of the next page. And they've seen signs along the way. Try Red Sammy's famous barbecue. None like famous Red Sammy's. Red Sam, the fat boy with the happy laugh, a veteran. Red Sammy's your man. Blah blah blah. They get there, and he's lying on the ground with his head under a car. Uh, excuse me, under a truck. They go inside, they order. Red Sam comes in, shirt off. Okay. Red Sam's wife, working at the counter, says middle of 364, about June Star. Ain't she cute? Would you like to come be my little girl? No, I certainly wouldn't. I wouldn't live in a broken down place like this for a million bucks. Again, showing what wonderful children these are, okay? Grandmother, you know, is ashamed because she's asked, aren't you ashamed? And that's when Red Sam comes in, wipes his face off, and says, you can't win, all right? These days, you don't know who to trust. Now, what's the context? When he says that, we have no idea. He just walks in, there's his family sitting there, and he starts talking to him and says, you can't win, you don't know who to trust. Kind of sounds like he's implying they're not trustworthy, okay? Grandmother, people are certainly not nice like they used to be. Notice for her, she said this idea now several times. This, like they used to be. The good old days, okay? Things were better when? You can define it a variety of ways. Before. So if they were better before, they're obviously worse now. So Red Sammy explains what he means. Two fellers came in here last week driving a Chrysler. Old beat up car, but it was a good one. These boys looked all right to me. Mere superficial appearance. They looked okay. Said they worked at the mill and you know I let them fellers charge the gas they bought. Now why did I do that? Now what does he mean when he says he let them charge the gas they bought? That's not charge like this. He means 
He let them fill up for however much gas he allowed them to put in on the basis of their word, their promise that they would come back and pay him later. That's what he means by charge. Okay? And he did that. Why? Because they looked all right. Why did I do that, he asks. I, what's he obviously implying? What hasn't happened? They haven't come back and paid. Okay. What's the grandmother say? It wasn't because they looked all right. It's because you're a good man. Okay. What's the title of the short story? A good man is hard to find. She says, you're a good man. What does that mean in this context? What did he do? He tried to be, tried to be nice. He helped somebody out who was in trouble or distress of some kind. Another one of Jesus' parables is about a quote-unquote good man. What's the parable? Anybody know? We still use the phrase today. In fact, we actually, some states have laws that are named after it. The Good Samaritan. Notice it's a good Samaritan. Anybody know what a Samaritan is slash was? Yes, <laughs> they were the lowest of the low. Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Samaritans were mixed race. They were from the area called Samaria. Okay, Jews looked down on, upon them. And in Jesus' parable, what's, he said, what's the point of it? Well, it's got two, really. One is that the good Jews who see the injured guy on the side of the road do nothing to help him. In fact, they cross over. A Levite, a priest, goes on the other side of the road so he doesn't have to be you know, confronted with this. And a Samaritan comes, the lowest of the low, the outcast of Jewish society, picks the guy up, puts him on his donkey, takes him to the nearest town, puts him up in a hotel, tells the hotel owner, I'll pay all his costs when I come back through this way. And Jesus says, which of these was what? Was a neighbor to the others, or to the other. And they be what he was. The Samaritan, go and do likewise. Go and be like him, okay? Red Sam is the good Samaritan in this novel, in this short story. So, she said, because you're a good man. Yes, I'm, I suppose so. As if he were struck with this answer. He didn't think of himself as a good man. What, reading into it a little bit, what did he think of himself as? Or what did he think he was doing? Louder? He was a fool? Possibly. What else? Was it being good? What's another word? I think you used it earlier. He's just being nice. Or, as some people today will say, he was just being human to another human. His wife brings out the orders, and she says, it is in a soul in this green world of God's that you can trust. And I don't count nobody out of that, not nobody. And she looks at her husband. Little backstory there somewhere. Because by looking at her husband the way the narrator described it, she's telling us, I don't trust him. And yet, what do good, uh, excuse me, what do Red Sammy's actions tell us? You can trust him. Okay? So the grandmother asked, do you read about that criminal misfit? The woman, Red Sam's wife, never named, 
I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he didn't attack this place right here. If he hears about it being here, I wouldn't be none surprised to see him. If he hears there's two sitting in the cash register, I wouldn't be at all. In other words, she won't be surprised, right? Because she said it now three times. Sam, that'll do. Nice polite way of saying shut up. Go bring these people their Coca-Colas. Red Sam, a good man is hard to find. The grandmother said, because you're a good man. Now Red Sam says, a good man is hard to find. Everything is getting terrible. I remember, and again, back in the good old days, you could go off and leave your screen door unlatched. Not no more. Okay, this is published in 1953. Red Sam is saying, whenever this is said, 1952, 1951, whatever, that he doesn't feel safe leaving his screen door unlatched. Notice, screen door, not like the solid front door that covers that. The implication is that door is still open. He's saying now in early 1950s, middle of nowhere, Georgia, I can't even leave my front door open and my screen door unlatched. Okay. What does he mean when he says everything is getting terrible? Notice he doesn't say everything is terrible. It's getting that way. He and the grandmother discuss better times. The old lady says, Europe's to blame for the way things were now. She said, the way Europe acted, you would think we were made of money. <laughs> Has anything changed between 1953 and 2023? I mean, think about it. What's going on in Europe right now? Eastern Europe. There's a big war, right? Who's it between? Is it between the United States and the Soviet Union? Is it between the United States and Germany or the allies and the Axis? No, it's not. It's between Ukraine and Russia. Is it? Where is Ukraine getting all of its military supplies from? It's getting some from French in Germany, in the Netherlands, in England. It's not getting hardly any at all from them. It's coming from us. Okay? And notice what she says. Europe's entirely to blame. You would think it, we were made of money. I mean, we're going to send 31 M1 Abrams tanks. And there's already talk in the Pentagon for sending F-16 fighter jets. There's concern among some, both left and right politically, um, this is going to get much, much bigger very, very fast. Okay, Why is she blaming Europe? This is shortly after what? World War II. World War II ended 1945. The United States began shortly after World War II what was called the Marshall Plan, named after the Secretary of State. And the Marshall Plan was to rebuild Europe. Our money, okay? Why did Germany become an economic powerhouse? Because we rebuilt it. And because we protected it. Germany didn't have a military for a long time. I don't even remember if it, no, it does today. But it's not offensive, it's defensive. Okay? Why did Japan become such an economic powerhouse? Because we rebuilt it. We wrote its constitution, we built its economic system. Okay? She's saying Europe's to blame. What's the implication of what she's saying? Because we're spending all of our money there and not here, okay? So, they drive off. That's, that's all that goes on at Red Sammy's. They have lunch, 
She calls Red Sam a good man. Red Sam says, a good man's hard to find. She blames everything on Europe. And Red Sam, by the way, says, no use talking about it. Not going to do any good. They drive off again. Okay. Outside of a town called Tombsboro, yes, foreshadowing again, Okay. she wakes up because she's fallen asleep. And she remembers an old plantation that she had visited when she was a young lady, that she had visited in this neighborhood, meaning in this part of Georgia, okay? When she was a young girl, excuse me, young lady, mid, late teens, early 20s possibly, she talks about the house, big plantation house, six white columns, you know, the whole nine yards, secret panel with hidden silver. What idea she just put in the kids' minds? Let's go get it. Let's find the house. Let's find the secret panel and steal the silver. Okay? So they start whining and belly aching and yelling and screaming, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay? Grandmother says, it's not hard, it's not far, it'll only take 20 minutes. Bailey, meanwhile, is, he's just driving. He's, he's toned everything out. Until the children really begin to yell and scream, and John Wesley's kicking the back seat, excuse me, kicking the back of the front seat, hitting his father in the kidneys. Dad's getting a little angry at this point, okay? And finally, he says, bottom of 365, all right, will you all shut up? Will you all just shut up for one second? If you don't shut, three times now, if you don't shut up, we won't go anywhere. <coughs> Grandmother, it would be very educational. In other words, it's for the children, right? You want to get something done, what, what rhetoric do you use? Oh, it's for the children. And you can, whatever. Bailey, all right. But get this. This is the only time we're going to stop for anything like this. This is the one and only time. Notwithstanding what happens in the rest of the story. If the rest of the story you didn't know yet, and you were to read that line after what had come before, how many of you think that's true? This is the only time they're going to stop. Bailey's going to stick to his guns. No. Why not? What kind of father is Bailey? What, do, what does he do if his kids complain enough and whine enough? He'll give in. Okay? So, she says it was down that dirt road that we went by ways back, a mile back. Oh, dirt road. By the way, this is the one and only time when he says that? More foreshadowing. It, there's a reason why it's the one and only time. So they turn around, they go down the dirt road, and Bailey, while they're driving, you can't go inside this house. People probably live there. He can't go inside the house. That's breaking and entering. He doesn't literally say those words, but he's still driving in this, what he thinks is the direction to this house. If he really believes what he's saying, what should he do? Turn around and get back on the road. But he doesn't. Okay? They turn down the dirt road. They race along. Bailey's like, if this place doesn't turn up, we're turning around. Grandmother, it's not farther. And as soon as she says that, the light bulb goes off and she remembers, nope, not here at all. The place she's thinking of, Tennessee. She's only off by a few hundred miles. And when she does that, she is startled. She kicks her suitcase, which is sitting on the basket holding the cat, knocks the suitcase off, the cat jumps out, Springs onto Bailey's back and neck, claws out. Notice the chain of events. Okay? 
and they crash. Children were thrown to the floor in the middle of 366, and their mother, clutching the baby, was thrown out the door onto the ground. Why was she thrown out the door? Because she didn't have a seatbelt on. Okay. The old lady was thrown into the front seat. The car turned over once and landed right side up in a gulch off the side of the road. Bailey remained in the driver's seat, with the cat clinging to his neck like a caterpillar. As soon as the children saw they could move their arms and legs, they scrambled out of the car, shouting, We've had an accident. Grandmothers curled up under the dashboard, hoping she was injured so that Bailey's wrath would not come down on her all at once. Bailey pulls the cat off of his neck and does what? Gently sets it down? No. Throws it out the window, we're told, against the side of a pine tree. Notice we're not told what happens to the cat after that. What's the implication? The cat's got a broken back. You throw a cat against a pine tree, you're going to break its back. The cat's not going to land against the pine tree like it will if you drop a cat. If you hold a cat upside down like this and drop it, the cat's going to land on its paws. You throw a cat against a tree, and it's going to whirl until it hits. Children again scream. Well, excuse me. Then Bailey gets out of the car. He looks for his wife. But notice that's not what it says. He looks for the children's mother. Why didn't Flanny O'Connor put it the way I said it first? What's the difference between looking for the children's mother and looking for his wife? Well, I don't know if it goes that far, but it, it indicates a, a distinction in the relationship. She is seen more as children's mother than as wife. I tell my kids, they're all grown, grown now, but I used to tell them, <laughs> I still every now and do, you know, no matter what comes, I love mom more than I do you guys. Why? She came first. <laughs> Period. End of statement. Push comes to shove, sorry, I'm sticking with her kind of a thing. That's, the, that's not the implication you get here, okay? So he goes and finds his, excuse me, the children's mother. And we're told she was sitting against the side of the red gutted ditch. Holding the screaming baby, she had a cut down her face and a broken shoulder. In other words, She's seriously injured. Children scream again in a frenzy of delight. We've had an accident. Why a frenzy of delight? To me, that indicates there's a screw or two loose up here. Okay? Hold on for a second. June star, but nobody's killed. And she sees her grandmother get out of the car. Limped out of the car, her hat still pinned to her head with the broken front brim standing up at a jaunty angle. Why the, but nobody's killed? Is that just a simple statement? We're all alive, that's good. Or, is it safe to read a little something into there? Like, damn, <laughs> the old broad is still breathing. I think it's more of the latter. Like, <sighs> we're free from her. No, we're not. So, here's the road. They're in a ditch. Off to the side of the ditch, there are trees. Over here, on the other side of the road, there are more trees. Off in the distance, you know, you can see the road as it winds its way across the hills and stuff. We're told the ditch is full of red dirt, or the gulch. Why? 
Go almost anywhere in Georgia and dig. And you get the red clay, okay? <clears throat> Mothers leaning against the red ditch. They all sit down in the ditch except the children, okay? Children's mother says, maybe a car will come along, meaning help. Grandmother, I believe I've injured an organ. She's got a bellyache. But no one answers her. <laughs> like, no one cares. Bailey's teeth are clattering. We get a description of the clothes he's wearing. Grandmother decides, I'm not going to mention about the house in Tennessee. The road's about 10 feet above. They could see only the tops of the trees on the other side. So, you know, if they're standing here, line of sight means they don't see this road at all. Again, looking down, kind of like down the gulch to a distance, they can see the road as it makes its way towards them. All right. Behind the ditch they're sitting in, there are more woods, tall, dark, deep. And then they see, ways in the distance, the cars start to approach. Grandmother stands up and waves. Let's get their attention. It's a big, black, battered, what? Hearse-like. Automobile. What's a hearse? Transports dead people. That's what a hearse does. It carries coffins from funeral home to cemetery. Okay? Three men in it. It stops right above them, so the hearse comes, drives down the road, and stops right here. They're all still down here. We've not been told that anybody has climbed back up to the top of the gulch onto the road. Driver looks down at him, turns his head, says something to the people in the car. They get out. One was a fat boy, black trousers, red sweatshirt. He moves over on the right side of them, stood staring. Other has on khaki pants, blue striped coat, gray hat. He goes around on the left side. So the driver stays up here. One comes down and stands here. One comes down and stands here with the family in between. Driver gets out of the car, looks at him. Older gentleman, beginning gray hair, hair beginning to turn gray. Has on blue jeans, too tight. He's holding a hat and a gun. Oh, yeah. The boys also had guns, like the narrators. Oh, I forgot to mention that. Children, we had an accident. Grandmother's like, I know who this guy is. And the guy says, good afternoon. See, you all had a little spill. We turned over twice, once. We seen it happen. Try their car and see, it. will it run, Hiram? John Wesley, wonderful little boy, perceptive little boy. What you got that gun for? What you gonna do with that gun? Lady, would you mind calling them children to sit down by you? Children make me nervous. I want all of you to sit down right there together where you're at, okay? June Star, what you telling us what to do? He's the one with the gun. I mean, a little read of the situation kind of tell you that. Bailey says, when the mother says, come here, come here. Bailey, look here now. We're in a predicament. We're in, what's he mean we're in a predicament? What is a predicament? It's a bad situation, right? It really doesn't have a, a positive outcome. We're in a predicament. We're in, and that's when the grandmother remembers. You're the misfit. I recognized you at once. Yes, 'm. 
But it would have been better for all of you ladies if you hadn't recognized me. Why? Now he has to do what? Now he's got to kill him. Because they recognize him, if he lets them live, they can tell the authorities where they saw the misfit. Dead people don't talk. Bailey turns his head sharply, says something to his mother, we're told, and she begins to cry. And notice what he said is unprintable again. Lady, don't you get upset. Sometimes a man says things he don't mean. I don't reckon he meant to talk to you that way. Oh, I kind of think Bailey did mean to talk to her that way. What do you think Bailey said? Yeah. Mom, would you for once shut the up? Just keep your mouth closed. In my own reading, okay? Could be entirely wrong. I kind of think it was more than just that. It, you know, probably this has been building, right? Just you listen to me here, baby. Listen to what this is. Day after day after day after day. He's put up with that. Okay? And what does the grandmother say? You wouldn't shoot a lady, would you? Notice, you wouldn't shoot two harmless children. You wouldn't shoot a baby. Really, what kind of person would shoot a baby? You wouldn't kill this poor mother with the broken shoulder and the blood down her face. You wouldn't shoot a lady. That is me. Screw them. Just don't. He says, I'd hate to have to. I know you're a good man. Whoa. Stop there for a second. You don't look a bit like you have common blood. I know you must come from good people or from nice people. I know you're a good man. She told Red Sammy he was a good man. What's the difference between Red Sammy and these guys? Other than that, as we find out, they're you know, murderers. What did Red Sammy do that justified, you're a good man? He helped two guys. This guy, she knows what about him? He's an ex-con. He's a murderer. Not ex as in he's done his time and got out. He's an escaped convict. Okay? And she says you're a good man. What does she mean by good there? Look at what she says. I know you must come, excuse me, you don't look a bit like you have common blood. You must come from a nice family. What do you mean by common blood and nice family? Those are euphemisms, by the way. You're not low life. You're not born to a low, you're not a Snopes. You're not one of Abner's children, okay? And he says, yes, I'm the finest people in the world. He goes on and talks about his mother. Okay. Talks about his father. He tells Bobby Lee, watch them children. You know, they make me nervous. And he looks up. Don't see no sun. Don't see no cloud neither. What the? Who gives a rip? Why do we get that? It's little detail. Authors love this because it makes the story more real. It's one of those stupid little things you might pay attention to if you're in this situation. Okay? She goes, yeah, beautiful day. Um, shouldn't call yourself the misfit. I know you're a good man. She, it's almost like she's saying, you should call yourself the good man. What does misfit mean or imply? Out of place. I don't belong. I don't fit with society, everyone else. 
I know you're a good man. I could just look at you and tell Bailey, shh, shh. Everybody shut up and let me handle this. And notice we're told he's squatting in the position of a runner. Like a runner gets down, when I ran track, gets down, feet in the blocks, hands on the ground, he's getting ready to bolt. In other words, screw my wife, screw my three kids, and definitely screw my mother. If I can get out of here, I'm going to. Hiram says, it'll take half hour to fix this car. He goes, okay. First you and Bobby Lee get him and that little boy to step over yonder. Would you mind stepping back in them woods there with them? Bailey, we're in a terrible predicament. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody realizes what this is. Oh, I think the misfit, Bobby Lee and Hiram realize what it is. I think the grandmother kind of is starting to formulate an idea. So what does Bailey mean? We're in a predicament. What's he really mean? We've got seconds to live. Grandmother reaches up to adjust her hat brim as if she's going to the woods with him, but it came off in her hand. She stood staring at it, and after a second, she let it fall to the ground. Why that little detail? What's the hat? Let me put it this way. What might the hat be symbolic of? Why would we be told she put on this hat in this dress the morning that they left? The same morning. So that if she was found on the side of a road, people would know she was a lady. Notice what's happening. That little fiction that she weaves around herself, it's starting to crumble. Okay. So, Hiram pulls Bailey up by the arm as if he were assisting an old man. It's not that he reaches down and grabs him by the hair or by the shirt collar. It's like he reaches down, grabs him by the hand, puts an arm maybe under the upper hand under the upper arm, let, let me help you up, okay? John Wesley caught hold of his father's hand and Bobby Lee followed. What's, what does that show us for the first time in the entire story between John Wesley and his father? Why does John Wesley reach out and grab his father's hand? He's scared. I think John Wesley's He's starting to understand what's going to happen. Why are those two boys with revolvers going to take them off to the woods? They go off towards the woods, and just as they reach the dark edge, Bailey turns around, supporting himself against a pine tree, and says, I'm back in a minute, Mama. Wait on me. Who's Mama? Is mama his mother? Or is he like, you know, some men used to do a couple generations ago, refer to their wives, if they had children, as mother. Not my mother, but the children's mother. Like, you know, we had that one description earlier in, in here. Okay. I think it's the former. He's saying to his mother, I'll be back in a minute, Mama. Wait for me. What does that mean to his wife? What does that mean about his wife? Or, let me rephrase it, what does that tell us about Bailey? We're told he was her, her only son, and she lived with him. Can you go anywhere from that with this statement? There's a phrase, I think, that might describe Bailey. Anybody know what it is? Mama's boy. She does everything for him, and he's never broken those strings. He's never really separated himself. 
from his mama. His mother cries, come back this instant. Bailey boy. And then she turns and looks at the misfit. I just know you're a good man. You're not a bit common. No, he says, I ain't a good man. But I ain't the worst in the world either. But Daddy said I was a different breed of dog. And he goes on and talks about, you know, some people can live their whole life without asking about it, and others has to know why it is. And at this point, he's talking about this is what his father said to him or about him. Some people will never ask the big questions in life. Other people will want to know why, 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 why. He's one of the latter. The misfit is one of those who's going to push the envelope and ask all kinds of questions. Okay? And he says, sorry, I didn't have a shirt on before. We buried our clothes when we escaped. We borrowed these from some folks we met. Yeah, borrowed? Don't think so. She says, that's all right. Maybe Bailey has an extra shirt in his suitcase. She goes, I'll look. Okay, where are they taking them? The children's mother screams. It's like she can, the shock has worn off. And she's holding the baby and she screams at him. And then the misfit goes on and talks about his father. Okay, grandmother, you know, would you like to get married, settle down, have a family? Live in a nice white, you know, house and such. You could be honest. All you have to do is try. Think how wonderful. Not have to worry about people chasing you. He says, yes, and someone's always after you. The grandmother noticed how thin his shoulder blades are. And then she asked, do you ever pray? Why? Church lady. No. Okay, we're out in the middle of nowhere in Georgia. When that pistol fires, you're going to hear that reverberation for a few seconds. It's just going to echo. Followed closely by another. The old lady's head jerks around. Why? She's looking towards the woods. Notice the description. She hears the wind move through the treetops like a long, satisfied insect of breath. Like it's sucking the life out. Baby boy. <coughs> okay. So the misfit gives kind of his resume. Sent gospel. He's done all kinds of stuff. Was in the military, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Grandmother, pray, 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 pray. Who's she speaking to? She's not telling him to pray. She's telling herself to pray. Why does she have to tell herself to pray? Because she's not praying. If she were really a quote unquote good Christian lady, she would already be praying. Because you don't have to verbalize it, right? You can pray in your mind, you can pray in your heart. And she's going, pray, pray, come on, remember how to pray. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. You can't even get that part out, you know? And he goes on talking about himself. He says, somewhere I did something wrong. I was buried alive. He doesn't mean he was literally buried alive. That's talking about prison. That's when you should have started to pray, she says. What'd you do to get sent to the penitentiary? And he's talking about the being buried alive. Turn to the right, it was a wall. Turn to the left, it was a wall. Forward, a wall. Behind me, a wall. Above me, we call it a ceiling. A wall. He's talking about being in a box, right? What is O'Connor talking about? Okay, because within the context, the immediate context of the story, he's talking about prison. But within the larger context of what did Red Sammy say? Things are getting terrible. That's the larger context that this phrase, I think, really is getting at. And it's the ideas here. So let me pause for a second. We're not going to finish this today, probably. In one of those letters that I posted the link to, 
O'Connor talks about you know, the duty or the, the responsibility of a Catholic Christian like herself, her responsibility was to portray the world as it really is. And that the church has got to confront the world as it really is when she's writing this letter in the mid-1950s. So what does that mean? What is the world as it really is? Well, post-World War II and all that kind of stuff. But she's talking about the, the main, the dominant ideas, the world view that was spreading throughout the Western world, let's say, in that period. So let me back up a little bit. Friedrich Nietzsche, if you want, you can just put down Fred. Friedrich Nietzsche, 19th century German philosopher. Okay? The one who came up with the phrase, God is dead. In fact, he said, God is dead and we have killed him. And because, Nietzsche said, because God is dead, everything is permissible. All right? But Nietzsche was the founder, so to speak, of the school of philosophy called nihilism. Okay? Neil, what? word do we use today that has this in the middle of it? Annihilate. What do you do when you annihilate somebody or something? You completely destroy it. You wipe it out as if it had never been. Nihilism is this belief system, this philosophy, that says there is no meaning to the world. There is no meaning to anything that exists. Period. And there's no meaning you can make for it. That is, nothing you do will ever mean Gidley's Court. Period. End of story, end of statement. What kind of outlook on life does that lead to? You become a nihilist. It's pretty bleak, folks. Almost no, I take that back. Not almost. Everyone who commits suicide, at the moment they pull the trigger, pop the pills, do the injection, they're totally within that mindset. Because that mindset says, not only is there nothing I can do, but there's nothing anybody can do, and nobody can help me. Nobody can help me. Okay? That's one thing. By the way, he died of insanity. <laughs> Might be interesting to note. Hitler loved Nietzsche and his philosophy. He wrote a book called Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche did, which is related to, the other day I mentioned Dostoevsky and the idea of the Superman. That Beyond Good and Evil suggests that there are people who are not bound by the common laws and morality of, of everybody else. The overman, the superman mentality. That's what Hitler loved. The Aryan nation idea, okay? Following Nietzsche, mid-19, uh, mid-20th century, French, two French philosophers, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, popularized the school of philosophy called existentialism, okay? There's an, another guy, late 19th century, named Soren Kierkegaard, who was kind of, existential before them, but his was a Christian existentialism, okay? So existentialism, it means we're here, we're now, like Nietzsche, there is no ultimate meaning to your existence, but the existentialist said, you can make meaning for your life. You can do something that shows people you were here and your life had meaning. The meaning there doesn't necessarily have to mean a good meaning. What, what they both suggested is that you had to validate, it's one term that's used, or authenticate your existence. You've got to give to your actions reason for why you are. And the way you do that, essentially, is by making sure that when you're dead, others know you lived. Others will realize so-and-so was here. Now, you can do that a whole bunch of different ways, right? What's one way you can do that? You could be like Red Salmon. 
you can let the guys fill up their car. They'll know that you were here. Or you could push the guys in front of a moving car and they get killed. In the instant that they die, they'll know you were there. Notice, it doesn't matter which one you do. Who will we remember, we humanity, remember a thousand years from now who lived in the early part of the 20th century and died towards the end of World War II? Hitler. He's going to be remembered forever. Just like today, remember people, we remember people like Genghis Khan, who was the Hitler of his day, and Julius Caesar. Okay? Good? Jesus. We remember him. Mother Teresa. People will remember her. Note, the idea of morality is, is not part of this. Because there ultimately, there is no external source for morality. And it's from this idea that what I think is moral good and true might be the opposite of what he thinks is moral good and true, and what the opposite of what she thinks is moral good and true. And what I think is not any better than what either of you think. It's the relative morality. It doesn't, we just have our own moralities, okay? Beginning of the 20th century, at the turn from the 19th to the 20th century, it was thought the 20th century is going to be a, a huge century of change, and it's all going to be positive. The 20th century was named the progressive century. Why? Humanity was going to keep progressing, evolutionary progression. And what is going to happen in the 20th century is we're going to wipe out poverty, inequality, disease, we're going to stop war, humanity's just going to get better and better and better. There was a journal that was begun, if I remember correctly, called the Progressive Century. Similarly, there was a journal that was begun, a magazine, called the Christian Century. This one is still being published. Not Christian in the sense everybody's going to follow Jesus, but everybody's going to become part of the social gospel being nice to everyone else, and that's going to bring heaven on earth. Literally, it was thought. Okay? And what happens 14 years in? The war to end all wars. The Great War, World War I. And what happens less than 20 years after the end of World War I? World War II. Notice, it's not called the Second Great War. It's not called really remain at this time, the war to end all wars. Because what happens five years after World War II? Korea. What happens within five years of Korea? Vietnam starts. 20th century has not been that progressive, etc. O'Connor's writing right smack in the middle when this mentality is everywhere. Okay? When he talks about in a box, Wall, 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 wall. One of the central tenets of this is alienation, isolation. We are all totally, completely alienated from everybody else, whether you think you are or not. That's why Ma Bell, AT&T, Back in the late 60s, early 70s, came out with an advertising campaign that you can use your telephone, anybody know what the phrase was? And reach out and touch someone via the telephone. Oh, shut up, Siri. Notice, when you're on a telephone, are you touching someone? You're talking with them. Not the same as contact. Okay. What entire industry is built on that idea that you can reach out and touch someone with whom you are not in contact today. Social media. Is it social? Social implies what? 
people together. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, they're not bringing people together. Because what is still happening? Wall, wall, you're still separated. Okay? We'll stop there. Uh, we've only got a few more pages, a couple more pages. So for Wednesday, for Wednesday, uh, we'll finish Good Man is Hard to Find. Go ahead and begin, um, not begin, read the reading drama stuff and start reading Sophocles, Oedipus the King, or Oedipus the King, because we will start it.